Now, the money spent in U.S. presidential elections, as we've been saying, is mind-boggling to so many people. And President Trump himself says he is ready to spend a billion dollars if it helps him stay in the White House. Atlantic journalist McKay Coppins created a new Facebook account so that he could follow MAGA-related pages, join groups, and receive messages from Trump supporters. And he told our Hari Srinivasan what he learned about the campaign's aim to spread disinformation, discredit journalists, Journalists and even dismantle mainstream media. McKay, thanks for joining us. So I want to start with a couple of paragraphs in your piece that are the worst-case scenario after all of your research and, and diving into this story. Uh, on Election Day, anonymous text messages direct voters to the wrong polling locations or maybe even circulate rumors of security threats. Deep fakes of the Democratic nominee using racial slurs crop up faster than social media platforms can remove them. As news outlets scramble to correct the inaccuracies, hordes of Twitter bots respond by smearing and threatening reporters. Meanwhile, the Trump campaign has spent the final days of the race pumping out Facebook ads at such a high rate that no one can keep track of what they're injecting into the bloodstream. After the first round of exit polls is released, a mysteriously sourced video surfaces purporting to show undocumented immigrants at the ballot box. Trump begins retweeting rumors of voter fraud and suggests that immigration and customs enforcement officers should be dispatched to polling stations. Are illegals stealing the election, reads the Fox News Chiron. Are Russians behind the false videos, demands MSNBC. If it was 10 years ago, I'd say that sounds like science fiction. Why is this so plausible to you after what you've been looking into? Well, what I found over the course of the last several months as I was researching and reporting this, this article is that there is a new and sophisticated suite of tools that are being deployed right now in the United States by political operatives and uh, various political coalitions to actively advance disinformation that helps their candidate. In the case of uh, this story and what I, I was focusing on, the coalition to reelect the president, that includes the campaign, uh, partisan media, pro-Trump political operatives, all of them are working in concert to advance false narratives, fan conspiracy fear theories, uh, and basically to confuse and disorient the electorate enough that he is able to win re-election. And, uh, you know, I, I put that worst case scenario in the piece in part to kind of illustrate what could happen on election day. Some of the experts I talked to said that doesn't go far enough. The, given the, the scale of the tools that are available to uh, political campaigns and the brazenness with which people on both sides, but especially those in the president's orbit, have shown in kind of advancing misinformation, it could get even worse than that. I can see politicians on the other side of the aisle looking at your piece and saying, hey, how is this different than what every president tries to do? They have the apparatus of the Democratic Party at their disposal. They have the power of the bully pulpit there. They have the ability to do these things. So what's so different about this? And why are you calling what the Republicans are doing disinformation versus what has always happened in politics is that people try to protect the power that they have by any means necessary? It's a fair point, and I should say that, you know, every presidential campaign I've covered, and certainly a lot more campaigns before that, have featured a fair amount of partisan spin and half-truths and outright lies, right? We know that political candidates say things that aren't true on the, on the campaign trail all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, what's different is both the type and the scale, I think. Uh, first of all, the tools that are available now make it a lot easier for those lies and spin and half-truths to travel around the internet. Uh, and, and a lot of voters on both sides of the aisle are so firmly ensconced in their own information bubbles that they're more susceptible than ever to this kind of disinformation without ever being exposed to fact checks or uh, information that might challenge the authority of what they already believe. The other thing is that we have not had a president, at least in a, a couple generations, uh, this willing to say things that are flatly untrue. I should, you know, say, I'm not talking about matters of ideological opinion or viewpoint, right? And there are all kinds of conservative arguments and liberal arguments uh, that, that I think are completely reasonable. And I, I, in my perfect world, 
2020 would be a year where we have a big ideological debate in this country. Mm -hmm. But that debate is very difficult to have when there isn't a common set of facts that most Americans are working from. And what the, the Trump campaign is actively trying to do, and I saw this firsthand as I was reporting this story, is to make it so that there is no common set of facts, that, it, that people are so confused and kind of disoriented by the onslaught of information and propaganda that they just throw up their hands and say, there's, there's no way to separate out what's true and what's not, so I'm not even going to bother. Uh, break down for us, what is the connection between, say, for example, when, a, when the president tweets something, what happens and how does that loop work? Well, as part of the research for this story, I actually created a separate Facebook account from the one that I typically used and subscribed to President Trump's page, that of his reelection campaign, and then kind of followed the Facebook algorithm as it suggested various other right wing accounts for me to follow. And what happened was I created a Facebook feed for myself that was uh, that was completely filled with. Uh, the messaging and content that the president and his allies are pushing out every day. And I have to say, it's a lot more sophisticated than I think a lot of people realize. You know, some of it is just sort of parroting what the president says on Twitter or what he'll say at a press conference. But a lot of it is, is actually uh, very slickly edited videos. For example, during the impeachment proceedings, there were days when I would be watching uh, the impeachment hearing live on TV. I would take stock of the, the witnesses and the evidence that was presented and sort of draw my own conclusions. And then later that day, I would look at this Facebook feed and see a video that the Trump campaign had created that actually took out of context clips from the same hearing that I had seen and s slapped them together in a way that made it seem like the hearing had exonerated the president or that it had been some sort of major triumph for the president. A and I have to say, even as a journalist who had gone into this with my eyes pretty wide open, I became disoriented by it. You know, I, I, there were moments where I would see one of these videos and say, wait a second, is that what happened? Did I misunderstand what I saw in the hearings? Uh, and, and I could see how easily people uh, of good faith who were not, you know, trying to uh, just see information that uh, they agreed with, but they could, they could become confused and disoriented by the constant onslaught of information and basically decide that it wasn't, worth uh, trying to sort out fact from fiction and either disengage or just become disillusioned. How did Brad Parscale, the person who was uh, Trump's kind of digital chief, how did he innovate around this? What did he do around the 2016 election that was so dominant? And what's happening now? So in 2016, the Trump campaign, after, after Trump won the nomination, uh, they, they kind of looked at the landscape, realized that they were outgunned by the Clinton campaign, did not have the same war chest that Clinton had, and, and didn't have the ability to advertise on TV the way that the Clinton campaign was. And what happened was Brad Parscale, who at the time was the digital director of the Trump campaign, um, decided to go heavy on Facebook and Google advertising, basically convince the campaign that we can get more bang for our buck by uh, advertising primarily on these digital platforms. And uh, he made use of a technique called micro-targeting that uh, maybe some of your viewers have heard about but don't know that much about. I, basically what it is is that um, you take the electorate, <clears throat> if you're a, the Trump campaign or any other campaign, and you slice it into very narrow, distinct, specific niches. And then you can tailor ads directly for those niches. And so what the Trump campaign did kind of masterfully was that they acquired a ton of data on voters in the United States and would break them into very small groups. So for example, if they wanted to uh, serve an ad about defunding Planned Parenthood, they could serve it directly to 800 pro-life Roman Catholic women in Dubuque, Iowa, and know that they would get a pretty positive result. Now, they didn't invent micro-targeting. It had been used by the Obama campaign in 2012. The Hillary Clinton campaign used it uh, a, a bit. But the Trump campaign was different both in how much it used micro-targeting and how many ads it created. There was a five-month period in the 2016 election where 
uh, the Trump campaign placed 5.9 million ads on Facebook, while the Clinton campaign placed just 66,000. So that gives you a sense of the scale. The other thing that they did was they were willing to use micro-targeting in ways that were kind of outside of political norms. So for example, uh, in the final weeks of the race, they micro-targeted ads directly to black voters in Florida uh, that said, Hillary Clinton believes African Americans are super predators. That was drawing from you know, the controversial quote that Hillary Clinton had given in the 90s talking about uh, gangs. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, kind of stretching the bounds of what, what she had actually said. But they served it to black voters in Florida, and there was a Trump campaign official quoted at the time who, who said that it was not really designed to win black voters over to, to Trump. Instead, it was designed to depress black turnout in Florida, basically to disillusion voters. Okay, so if there are gonna be more Facebook ads in 2020, how consequential is the, the decision by Facebook as a platform not to fact check anything, to basically not hold the political ads to the same standard that they would hold if you and I were just selling a product? Yep, that, and that's a key point. I'm glad you brought that up because commercial advertising on Facebook is held to basic standards of truth in advertising. You are not allowed to run an ad that just blatantly lies about your product. Facebook will pull the ad if you do that. That's not true for politicians. Mark Zuckerberg actually announced last year when he was under a lot of pressure over this question of how misinformation was spreading on his platform. He said, look, we're gonna crack down on some of it, but we believe that we shouldn't be in charge of arbitrating political speech. So if a politician decides to run an ad that's false, we're gonna allow that to happen and leave it up to journalists and watchdog groups and opposition parties to, to decide whether the, the ads are true. Now, to a certain extent, I sympathize with that because I, I don't think that Silicon Valley companies should be the final word on what kind of speech is allowed in our political arena. But at the same time, when you're looking at the amount of information that is available on Facebook, the relatively scarce resources that journalists like me have and the relatively short, uh, relatively small amount of time we have to sort through all of the ads that are being posted, you start to see the problem here. Uh, so I, I think it is a consequential policy decision that ma Facebook made. And I think that um, it, it basically incentivizes politicians to stretch the truth and lie because it'll be very hard for them to be held accountable and it'll be easy for them to take advantage of the political benefits of lying on Facebook uh, with relatively little downside. So one of the things you also point out is that in addition I mean, if two or three cycles ago we were talking about robocalls and then maybe a couple of cycles ago we were talking about emails and even if last year we were talking about Facebook ads, that text messaging is going to be yeah. an important part of this cycle. How? Right. So uh, until pretty recently, uh, for a campaign to include you in a mass text, you had to opt in. You had to give your phone number to that campaign and say, I'm willing to accept text from you. Uh, what's happened is that in the last few years, peer-to-peer -peer texting apps have been uh, created, which basically enable campaigns to hire staffers or even give volunteers this job and have them sit down and just literally cl click send over and over and over again and send hundreds of messages in the, in the space of an hour. And to the FCC, that kind of texting is not considered mass texting, it's considered one-on-one -on -one texting which basically has meant that political campaigns have been on this mad scramble in the last few years to suck up as many cell phone numbers as possible so they can then uh, send messages to them. Because of the advent of these peer-to-peer -peer texting apps and because there's relatively little federal regulation around them, it's entirely possible that uh, later on in the race, uh, as we enter a new stage of this election, you could see campaigns or outside political groups using these peer-to-peer -peer texting apps to spread disinformation, to confuse people about where they're supposed to vote or when the election is, uh, to run false flag operations, tagging up, uh, opposing candidates with, op with uh, you know, positions that they don't actually hold. Uh, there are a lot of experts I've talked to who say this could be a big problem. They believe that regulators will eventually catch up to it, but that at least in this election cycle, uh, you should be 
a, a little wary of any kind of weird political text message you get that you uh, that you didn't sign up for. There have been a lot of stories over the last couple of years, actually not a lot of stories, I should say, there have been a few stories about a lot of different websites that look like they are coming from a specific community, but they're actually not. They're, they're fronts, and it's from a centralized place. How does that work? Yeah, so... Uh, you know, the last decade or so has been brutal for local journalism. Local newspapers have been shutting down across the country. Uh, something that's emerged to fill that vacuum, but in a very different way, have been these sort of faux local news sites. I call them Potemkin local news sites, where if you look at them, they have kind of innocuous names like the Kalamazoo Times or the Arizona Monitor. They sort of look like local news websites. You can scroll through them. They have coverage of, of local schools or, or whatever. But if you look closer, you'll see that they don't have local addresses. They often don't have mastheads or bylines. Uh, it's not clear who's behind them. A lot of them are actually owned and operated by Locality Labs, which is a, uh, a company owned by a conservative activist. Others are run by lobbying groups or, or even local Republican parties. And I, I spoke to one political strategist who told me how they're often used, which is that a candidate who uh, wants to get a certain story placed about an opponent uh, and the local journalists won't actually take it, they can actually pay a third party to have their desired headline placed in one of these websites. And, uh, and the average reader who's just kind of scrolling through Facebook and comes across this will have no idea that the website has a political agenda. They'll think it's just a normal news story. Uh, but that's what actually makes these valuable. Is there such a movement at this scale on the left? I don't want to paint a false equivalence, but what has the left been doing? This is kind of an open debate among Democratic strategists right now. So I, I, I would say that it's much more sophisticated, much more advanced. and you know, much more, for lack of a better word, brazen on the right. But there is, a, you know, another information ecosystem on the left where um, there are Democrats openly kind of discussing whether they need to co-opt the same tactics that the president is in order to beat him in 2020. Um, what I would say is that we won't have a really clear idea of how far or how they're willing to go until we have a Democratic nominee. Uh, but... I, my concern really in writing this piece wasn't with the immediate horse race or, or who wins this election, but what happens to our information ecosystem going forward. Because I do think if we get into a situation where both major political coalitions in this country decide that the only way to win is to actively engage in propaganda and disinformation and to kind of trick voters into voting for them, then we, we have a real problem with the health of our democracy that will expand, extend well beyond 2020. Okay, Coppins, thanks for joining us. Thank you.